Well, thank you all for being here. And I know we have uh, members uh, of the press joining us on the phone as well. Um, first of all, uh, let me just say uh, that we all are praying um, for the families who've lost people because of the virus. Um, we uh, thank all Americans for all of the sacrifices that you're making, uh, that we're all making, and the sacrifices that, that you will make. Uh, we, we would like to be in a position where we can say that the road out of this is uh, going to be easy or going to be fast, uh, but it won't be. It won't be over tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be hard, but we will make it through because we are Americans. We are a great nation. We're the greatest nation that has ever existed, and great nations are not paralyzed by sickness. Together we have a job to do. And it's a job that includes ensuring that this never happens again. And it's a job that we in Congress must be convened to do. After 9-11, we had to make major policy changes in this country. We now face a similar challenge. We must make the kinds of changes that we know are necessary because of the vulnerabilities that this pandemic has exposed. We cannot be reliant on the Chinese Communist Party for our pharmaceuticals. We cannot be in a position where they can blackmail us. This is an issue that we've discussed for a long time. But the moment that the Chinese Communist Party's state news agency suggested that they would withhold medications that the United States might need in order to counter and fight COVID-19, the world changed. We must take action, and we must take action now to ensure that we are not held hostage and to ensure that we are not blackmailed. Taking action as a government requires that the people's house function. And for us, as the representatives of the people in our government, the most direct representatives of the people, not to have been here, not to have been functioning, not to have been called into session for weeks and weeks now is simply unacceptable. So we call on the Speaker of the House to work in a bipartisan fashion. And a bipartisan fashion, I would just point out, doesn't mean just consulting with our leader, Kevin McCarthy. It means getting the concurrence of the minority leader, getting the concurrence of the Republicans for any changes they want to make. But we must make changes. We must recognize that we have to be able to function. We have to be able to deliberate. We have to recognize the new environment in which we are operating. And I am confident that we will be able to do that. I am confident that we will finally be able to pass this PPP program the program that's been delayed now unnecessarily for so long, a program on which there is no disagreement about the importance of this program. But we've watched the blocks by the Democrats and we've watched the delays and it's now time to stop. It's time to pass this program that's going to provide the kinds of support and assistance the people of this country need. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our whip, Steve Scalise. Thank you, Liz. It's really important that we are back here in Congress, back doing the people's work. Uh, as millions of Americans at home are, are sheltering, they're homeschooling, as, as my wife is doing uh, with our two kids right now, uh, as they're wondering whether or not their job is going to be around when this is over. Uh, millions of Americans, over 20 million Americans, uh, don't have a job right now because they, they're unemployed. It's important that Congress is here working uh, to get through these issues, to work with the president to confront uh, this, this virus, this uh, hidden enemy uh, that we're all facing, uh, but also looking with an eye towards the future, uh, how we're going to reopen this economy in a safer, smarter way. Uh, nobody suggests there's a false choice between economic health and personal health. We have to do both. We absolutely can do both when we start opening the economy up again. I'm proud that my governor, I worked with him, we met last week and talked about reopening issues. And next week in Louisiana, elective surgeries will start again. And just think about this. While people have been home, uh, while people have been trying to bend the curve down, and clearly we're starting to see the curve down be, come down in so many areas, uh, we also know that people have been foregoing those critical tests, the life-saving tests. Uh, mammograms, colonoscopies, so many other procedures that people would normally be doing to protect their own health that aren't happening right now. Uh, we're unfortunately seeing suicides up, 
mental health problems that are starting to overwhelm mental health officials. So there is another cost uh, to this virus uh, because people are losing so much, losing their jobs, losing their businesses, losing their old way of life. There's a cost to that too. And so we need to weigh all of that as we look towards opening the economy up again in a safer, smarter way, uh, while we also confront uh, how the health community is catching up with this disease. I'm encouraged every day when I hear breakthroughs. Uh, drugs that were used effectively for things like lupus or malaria uh, that are now proving effective for some people, not all, but some people uh, with COVID-19. There are more breakthroughs like that in the pipeline uh, that we hear about every day, testing that's being done that shows real encouragement. To see the brilliance of our medical community in the United States, that shows you just the power and the magnitude of what we are capable of doing when we put the resources of the United States government behind an initiative. And I think you've seen the country come together uh, like no time we've seen in generations to confront this hidden enemy. I applaud President Trump and what he's been doing to lead this effort, uh, to give guidance through CDC to the states so that the states can make the best decisions where ultimately those decisions are being made. But every day the president goes to work in the, in the White House. The president has cabinet secretaries coming through. The president has had uh, people who have survived COVID-19, who tested positive, had COVID-19, have now recovered, uh, that have been over to the White House. And yet you see the House of Representatives, the People's House, shut down. You saw an effort yesterday by Nancy Pelosi in secret at 2.30 in the morning to drop a document to literally change the way Congress has voted for over 200 years, to go to some proxy system that had never been vetted, uh, was not a bipartisan effort. She didn't even uh, work through with our leader, Kevin McCarthy, to try to come up with a way to allow members to uh, talk about changing the way we, we vote to have some remote process. None of that was done. They literally dropped a bill at dark of night uh, to try to allow one person, theoretically, to have the proxy of dozens of members of Congress. That's not who we are. Uh, we strongly urged against it. We whipped against it yesterday. And I'm glad that Speaker Pelosi pulled that uh, bad idea today. We've got to work together through these challenges. Uh, I think it's so important that Congress renew the PPP program. This Paycheck Protection Program has been a lifeline to small businesses all across this country. Uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin just said uh, that we've saved over 30 million jobs with that first tranche of PPP funding. It was so successful that it ran out of money last week. We predicted that it would, and we were calling on Speaker Pelosi for weeks not to wait till the midnight hour, but to renew that program before it expired so that those small businesses would still have that lifeline. And more importantly, the tens of millions of workers that are represented by those small businesses, because of course, at least 75% of the money has to be spent on workers. Uh, those men and women who are doing these important jobs to make our economy what was the hottest economy in the world and what will again be the hottest economy in the world. We will get back to a strong, healthy economy and President Trump will lead that effort, but this program needed to be renewed. It shouldn't have expired uh, for whatever reason. I know Speaker Pelosi and some of our allies were actually using this as leverage. They used that term. They said it's leverage to try to get other things. This isn't the time to be playing political games. This should have been done weeks ago. Uh, these millions of families who are wondering whether or not they're gonna have a job to go back to should not be left in limbo. We had set up a portal at republicanwhip.gov PPP where over 400 small businesses across the country have now uh, signed up and told us, shared their stories with us at just what the PPP would mean to them that were denied the ability to get that funding. They talked about, in many cases, family-owned businesses that were about to go under and some that are, unfortunately, going bankrupt today that are laying off millions of people this week that wouldn't have laid them off if that funding was in place today. So while it's so good that we're gonna be renewing this program tomorrow, and putting that additional injection of hundreds of billions of dollars into the program, uh, the week long that we went without it happening because the speaker decided to play games uh, cost millions of people their jobs. Uh, let's not let that happen again. Let's continue to work together uh, to achieve what is so important for so many families, and that is economic security with health security at the same time. I've talked to health experts from all around the country, I've talked to some of the biggest hospitals in New Orleans who are doing such an heroic job with those men and women in the hospitals, the, the doctors and nurses, and all the other professionals that are take, 
taking care of people in New Orleans and so many other cities as they're confronting this challenge. They said there are smarter ways that we can go back to our economy that we had before where businesses can open up again. Uh, recognizing that there's still going to be social distancing, recognizing that we're going to take bigger precautions. Maybe they're going to have a thermometer where they check your temperature uh, before you go into a building uh, or before you go into a work establishment and make sure that if somebody's got a high temperature over 100 degrees, you go and test them. Uh, there are a lot of other things that you can do to get this economy going again, but we need to get it done soon. And I applaud what the president has done to confront this. And I'll just finish up on this. We see great stories every day of what people are doing heroically, uh, getting creative to try to find cures, getting creative to try to bring some of that supply chain that Liz talked about oh, back from China so that we don't have to rely on China for our PPE. We can focus on holding China accountable for what they did to hide from the entire world what was going on with COVID-19 when it started in Wuhan. But in the meantime, at the Pete Maravich Assembly Center on the campus of LSU, literally right across the street from Tiger Stadium, where I, as a second year sophomore at LSU, lived in Tiger Stadium, the Pete Maravich Assembly Center, where Shaquille O'Neal played basketball when I was a student, is now a manufacturing facility where they're making PPE. They're making gowns and masks for hospital workers in that same building the Pete Maravich Assembly Center where Shaquille O'Neal played basketball when I was a student. So everybody is pulling together, everybody's getting creative and doing more things to allow us to rebound from this hidden enemy. But in the meantime, the House ought to be doing the people's work as well. Uh, Speaker Pelosi shouldn't try to be pushing people away or try to be holding everybody's vote as a proxy so that she can run everything as a dictatorship. That's not what this great democracy is all about. And leading this effort, who has been at the forefront of pulling our members together, coming up with creative ideas to confront all of these challenges we face, is our leader, Kevin McCarthy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for joining us. Um, to start, for every American on the front line, for those who are in the hospital, from the doctors to the nurses, from those who are making the gowns, the masks, from those who are restocking our shelves, from the truck drivers, to the farmers, we want to say thank you, a sincere thank you, for being for our country as we go through this. When we combat the virus from a distant land that we did not invite and we did not want, we will defeat it together and united. For the family members who have fought and for those who have lost family, loved ones, when you couldn't even be near them, you're in our prayers. But this is a commitment we make to you, that we will not stop working until we defeat this virus. And to do so, Congress needs to act. I did not think it would take this long to continue to put more money in for small business, a program that in 14 short days was able to get out the equivalent of what the Small Business Association was, administration was able to do in 14 years. But it's a critical time, and that's why we have to work together. For every American that's sacrificing, thank you. For the companies and the small business, more than 1.6 million were able to get resources to pay the workers, even if they're not there, their rent and the utilities, to keep your doors able to be open, even though that you cannot work right now. For those 700,000 applications that are sitting in, I'm sorry that Congress could not act as we wanted to two weeks before, so we never would have had to shut down. For those who got an got laid off last week because Congress would not act, that's unbecoming. That is not the action. We are better than that as a Congress. We asked for this money two weeks ago. It never should have stopped. We shouldn't have to be at where we are today. I had a long conversation with the Speaker today. She has postponed the proxy vote. Anything we do inside dealing with COVID, I think should be bipartisan. I've had many conversations with our Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer, on ideas and ways that we can open back up looking at committees and others. I sent a letter to the Speaker yesterday with some of those ideas. In our conversation, I felt it was very productive that we could start looking at that. Congress is essential. The American public needs to see that we're working. The American public has to understand that we could do it in a safe manner so states and others could begin to open as well. We will defeat this virus, but we will only do it together. 
Congress on both sides of the aisle should make a pledge to stop any more political games at holding up re resources that are needed for small business and others. When we look at the money that had already gone out, more than 74% of it went to small businesses that had less than $60,000 in payroll a month. More than 60% of it was given out by small banks with less than $10 billion in assets. In my own home, I got a, re I got a call and a text. We have a private, in private ambulance company. She called because she was almost in tears saying that she was about to lay off individuals. This is a family business that's for years that's never had to do that. And she was so fearful that she was afraid that a 911 call would come in and there would not be a paramedic to go. But she said, because of this program, they will not. I had other calls from small businesses that said, those that they have laid off, they're making a phone call right now to call them back in, that they will get paid. That's what the program's used for. If there is anybody out there that misuses this program, that takes advantage of a situation that quickly we want to get money out in and it was not intended for you, we will find you. Give the money back. I don't even care if it's less than 1%, that's 1% too much. You will, want, you will not want the reputation that you will soon get if you take advantage. Now is the time for all Americans to come together. For those who do not need it, do not take it. For those who do, we want it to be there for you because we want to work together to solve this problem. With that, let me take questions and we got a phone here as well. So I think you hit star one and you can uh, question. Yes. Okay. Yes. I had a conversation with the speaker today. I told her, I think this is very redundant for this reason. Inside the CARES Act, we wanted to make sure about accountability. So we created three new entities to oversee the money going out. One that is done with inspectors general. They will pick among themselves to look after it. Another is a presidential appointment confirmed by the Senate for five years. We provided more than 25 million for that. And then a third one on top of that is a congressional oversight where I appointed French Hill. She appointed uh, Congresswoman Donna Shalala. Both of them are, I believe, very good appointments. Congresswoman Shalala was a former uh, HHS secretary. French Hill's former worked in the Treasury, small business, owned a bank. You're not going to get anything past French. Collaborative, I think that is a very good working arrangement. In talking to the speaker, what this committee was designed to do, I, I don't see the use. We have an oversight committee. Every single committee has oversight. I want them all working and the committee's coming back together. The speaker tried to commit to me that this would be a bipartisan committee. I told her I don't view it that way. I view it more as a political one. I don't see a lot of members voting for it on our side. And I told her I would wait before I would appoint anybody to it to see who she appoints to it. If she is serious about making this a committee that works. But again, we've already put in three oversight committees beyond the oversight committee we have in Congress, plus every single committee in Congress has an oversight committee, and I expect us all work together with that. Yes? I think we should have uh, contact tracing, but the problem here with the governor of Michigan, she went against all norms. She literally gave it to a political consultant that she buys data from. She quickly pulled it back when sunlight was brought to that. This is what we're talking about. Stop playing politics in a time of coronavirus. I'll tell you, the American families do not expect this, nor do they want this. They are battling with something we have not seen before. And for someone to play politics with this and bring politics into it is completely wrong. That's why when it was brought to the, the attention of the American public, she had to pull it back. You need to be smarter about this and you need to have guidelines. Yes.
Well, the first place you'd want to do about that, think about how much we have passed already. This is almost, this is over a $400 billion bill. The one before was more than $2 trillion. Um, we should have that all implemented and working before we look to pass something else. Let's see what the data, what we need. And in doing so, that was my, why my letter was to the speaker. That was the conversations that the majority leader and I, Steny Hoyer, have had for many times. How could we operate the capital? When I look at the states, they're not all opening up at once, but in phases. We could have committees, and committees do the critical work. And that's what needs to come back. You could have committees working today and inside the letter asset. Committee size, we could put you in the auditorium. We could use the Ways and Means Committee so we have social distancing, just as we are in this press conference. We could have social distancing. We can work in public and work through that Why Congress is not voting, work the committee process, and then when the bill comes forth, you could bring them in. Tomorrow, we're going to give you an example of that. It'll be nine different sections of members to come vote with a time slot. So you'd come in certain doors and out the others. The ninth section is one if you miss the vote. The others will be alphabetical and you will give it a time slot to come. This nation has been through so much. We have overcome every obstacle and we will in this one as well. The last thing we would want is Congress to stay home and not act. The nation needs us to and we can do it in a safe manner. And that may mean just bringing certain committees back and working until we get to the point of a bill. As a follow-up, since this box-to-vote voting bill has been taken kind of off of the table, um, why do you think that it's important that box-to-voting has not been in the past in the House or has been passed now? And why did you not want to see The part I did not want to see is to change more than 200 years of history just by one party. What I, what I committed to the speaker was, let's study this in a bipartisan manner. Because things are different. After 9-11, they took four years thinking of pandemics as well. We've been through war and others, and this, this body has still been able to meet. Whatever we do when it comes to voting and others should be bipartisan. And I made a commitment to her that we would, we would be able to look at that and get to that point, just as the commitment I made to her that let's start planning for the opening. I've had discussions with the majority leader. Let's put a small group together and let's put that formation going so committees can work. Um, I'm not saying what will come out on the other end, but we should look at all ideas. I think you have um, Congressman McGovern and Tom Cole on rules. Um, Zoe Lofgren and Rodney Davis were my ideas. Put those four together. House administration that deals with a lot of this in the Rules Committee. And let's look at all the options. Had that bill passed through, it would be on a simple partisan basis. So you would have one member of Congress that could hold as many proxies as they wanted to. We do a census every 10 years. We devise districts based upon population. And then our constituents lend us their voice for two years. They don't lend the voice to another member of Congress. And would you want one member of Congress to have 30 votes or more? That's why it needs to be thought out. What is the best way to deal with this? And also, there should be a sunset. If this is only about coronavirus, then only make it that time period. Hopefully, we are over the peak of this and we could get back to be uh, performing in a normal manner. It wouldn't be all at once, but we could put stages and you have to plan for that and start acting for that. And I don't think coming back and just politically moving a proxy bill that empowers a few is right for America. Now, I don't know, is this on speaker, the phone? Does somebody have a question? Did you clean this phone? Can I touch it? Is that all right? I've been tested today, so I'm fine. Is there a question? Hello? On the, on the phone line, we have Paul Kane. All right, Paul, go Dr. ahead. Sure, I'll let. In the Washington Post here. Uh, hope this is coming through clear. It is. Um, can, can you give us a sense of what type of safety measures, you know, in terms of how many people can you, can come back and how many just bringing all of the members of Congress back means you have to exponentially increase the number of police that are there guarding the Capitol. 
um, you know, and also the travel. You're talking. I mean, how much travel are you talking about back and forth? Mario Diaz Ballard told me that the quote last thing you want is to have members traveling back and forth, bringing the virus with them. Paul, that's a great question. Let me restate it so the others can hear it. The question was, what if you're bringing everybody back? What is the planning? The last thing that could possibly happen is not to plan for this. I do not envision, and I am not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but the one thing I do know is Congress can still act by, in a safe manner, working with them. I would not envision bringing all of Congress back at once. You could bring committees back. I would not open up the Congress to the public right now, but if the committees were to act, I would measure it based upon the committee room. They do not need to use the committee room they currently are. We could put you in the auditorium, space you out. So we would be in a safe manner. It would be only those members, and they could work in a committee fashion. When the bill was um, passed and it needed to be passed on the floor, just as we're going to vote tomorrow, we'll do it in a different manner. You would only have so many members on the floor to vote during that time period. I would, I would not bring your staff back, and when it came time to phase in staff, I would limit it based upon the size of your office. Our offices are pretty similar if you look at just in Cannon, Longworth and Rayburn from the building that you are in. I would do a staging of which staff could be in there at that time. We can get this done. You raise a lot of obstacles, but there are a lot of answers for it. The only answer that I believe is not acceptable is for Congress not to do nothing. Let's plan for it, let's find our way to deal with it, and we can. We have a lot of big buildings here that everybody doesn't have to be filled in, but that gives you a lot of space to be able to have committee hearings. Yes? Now, I'm not the majority leader, so I don't do to get to do the schedule, but I've had many discussions with Stinney Hoyer about this. He called me um, even before he put out for the May 4th. And he also raised this issue, and it's the right issue, not knowing if that's the date we'd come back. But there are, there are weeks coming up where they were district work period. One happened to be in July when the Democrats were going to do their convention. One of the issues he raised with me, now we're not doing our convention that time, we have been gone, we may use that to be working back here. There may be time in August that we need to be working back here. He doesn't have it solidified yet, but he raised that issue with me. I told him I, that I agreed with that, that we should look at and it would be a modified calendar. I don't get to do the calendar, but those are the discussions I've had with him. Operator, is there another question? You better hurry, it's low battery. Christina Peterson, please state your outlet. Uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, looking ahead to future legislation, House Republicans be open to more funding for voting by mail if it did not include any any policy mandates for states? Say that one more time. I'm sorry, Christina. In, in upcoming bill, would you guys be open to more funding for voting by mail in November's elections if it did not include any policy mandate for states? So just money, not me, for you run your election. So the question right now was, would we be open to funding money when it comes to elections in November? Um, that's something people can look by at mail. by mail. What I, am, what I am most interested in right now is anything dealing with coronavirus. So I'm dealing with how do we solve this problem? How do we provide more testing? Look at the antibodies, making sure we're getting a vaccine and others. The November election is the November election. That's something we could discuss later, but I'm not interested in, in holding up money to small businesses for the idea about an election in the future. But I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I wouldn't look at anything, but I'm just saying we need to prioritize, and right now there are other crises than a November election. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. Is because there are examples of people who contracted the virus when they went to vote in person in Wisconsin. So I think there's a safety concern um, that the existence of the virus could inhibit people's ability to vote poll. You're right. And inside California, each state is different, and states make up how the process they are to vote. In California, we have a very liberal view when it comes to absentee ballots and others. I vote by absentee. I, I would think any, there has to be safeguards around it, how you register someone around there. I have heard others who had a con conversation as how they were trying to um, work, how the absentee would um, 
how you'd sign up if there's any tests uh, to know that that individual uh, accountability of that, that that is the individual signing it. There is fraud involved that we have found from the LA Times and others report. So you'd want to make sure that you have safeguards in for anything you deal with the election. But in my point, what I think is this is just as we leave it up to the governors of when they're going to open up um, their state, governors are ones who and state legislatures decide on how the election process works. Um, I would hate to federalize any election. All right, any other question? The, the, the phone is on low battery, so if there's no other ones, I want to thank you for coming out today and look forward to continuing to work with you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Better charge the phone. Yeah.